All right. Hey, everybody. This is Christina Previtt, the CEO and co-owner of New Jersey Divorce Solutions. Thanks for joining us today. You may recall we have a special guest, paramedic lawyer Matthew Strieger. He joined us last week and he's joining us again to teach us today about some of the top things that we really should know how to do in an emergency. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Thanks for having me as always. Uh, this was kind of a fun idea you had last week to do this uh, this topic this week, so. And I have to also say that joining us is also your son, Jackson, who's 11 years old, and I'm quite sure knows how to do far more in an emergency than I do. And I love that there are police sirens right outside my door. <laughs> <laughs> you do that on purpose. Yes, what's that. happening? What is that? They're coming for you. <laughs> it's kind of appropriate given the topic, right? Kind of funny. You're playing my song. Oh, are you kidding? <laughs> the guys with the white jackets come in to, to take you away. That's funny. Um, I don't think it's an emergency. <laughs> That's already right, I'm just gonna ride this out. Is it a holiday? <laughs> <laughs> no. May 14th. I don't think May 14th is a holiday. Maybe they're they're observing like nurses no. something or other. No, don't anyway, worry. thank you. <laughs> All right. That seems kind of appropriate though, considering what we're talking about. It is kind of funny. So thank you for joining us too, Jackson. I can't wait to see what you've got up your sleeve. Literally and figuratively for this one. So yeah. with my able-bodied assistant today. Um, and for those of you who don't remember, Matthew is also a paramedic, right? I am a paramedic, although I don't uh, I, I don't practice as much at the, the advanced level these days because it's hard to keep clinical competency. Um, but the basic stuff and what we're going to talk about today is all basic stuff. And I still do that uh, fairly regularly. I can't see you. Can you move your camera over a little? Because I'm getting like half of your face. Uh -huh. <laughs> Are we cut off? Uh, how's that? That's good. Yeah. All right. So what do you think? How should we get started with this? Well, I, I know that for me, if there was a real emergency, I some examples I gave you last time, I really wouldn't know exactly what to do if someone had a stroke or how to even identify if somebody really had a stroke right. or if somebody just got pulled out of the pool or necessarily if someone was choking or if they had a really bad burn or if they fell you know, some of that stuff, I kind of, I might be able to figure something out from watching television, but I really don't feel like I would be the best person to have around if one of those things happened. So it's funny because a lot of the stuff you're covering are, um, there's a lot of old wives tales about things. You talk about burns, for example. One of the things people do is they put stuff on burns. So one of the first things you learn is, you know, a basic EMT is never put goo on a burn. That's one of those funny little things they talk about, you know, butter and Crisco and anything but water to put the burn out and stop the burning is something they teach you. But there's a lot of very advanced stuff. If you wanted to really go into, you know, childbirth and burn treatment and all of those things, it would require a lot of training, more than we have the time for here in a half an hour. So I wanted to try to hit a couple of things that I think the average person can really take from this and learn from and get a couple of quick pearls that we can go over that really can make a difference. And the first one for me is how to call 911. And that sounds kind of silly, like, duh, you call 911. But knowing how to generate a 911 call, when to do it, and how the system works on the back end can really make a difference. Note, again, if you call 911 from a cell phone, it's very different than calling 911 from a landline. When you call 911 on a landline, the phone works differently. So in an emergency, on a, the average landline, you have to dial 9 to get an outside line or pick it up and turn the phone on, get a dial tone, and then dial 911. Or in a cell phone, you're dialing 911 send, and it's a completely different pathway. So you got to be aware of that. But the biggest difference between a cell phone 911 call and a, and a landline 911 call, anything that's coming from an office or a house, is when you call 911 from a house or an office, they know where you're calling from. It automatically pops up on a screen that the dispatcher has at every dispatch center in the state around the country, and it'll tell you the address of the place where you're calling from. So even if you can't say a word, they know where to go, which is cool, and they can figure it out when they get there. If you're calling from your cell phone, most places can't. 
So you have to be super clear when you call 911 from a cell phone. If you don't get anything else out, you got to tell them where you're calling from. And you got to be real specific too. I live at Five Estate Road in Hillsboro. If you call from Five Estate Road, they're going to come to a single family house. So it's easy to get in. If you're calling from an apartment or a hotel or a school or um, uh, you know something else with multiple rooms and it, multiple floors, you got to tell them. If there's buildings, you have to tell them because that's the most important thing. They'll figure out what's wrong when they get there. But if you don't tell them exactly where you're going, they won't be able to. And even with the GPS on phones, some 911 systems are putting in the advanced stuff to call, um, to do uh, advanced 911, enhanced 911 is what it's called. And when they do enhanced 911, they can tell you where you are in two dimensions, but they can't tell where you are. And I'm to make sure if I'm getting on the screen here, they can't tell in three dimensions. So if you're above the level of the call, you know, if you're on the fourth floor, they have no way, GPS can't tell you that. So you really have to be clear. The other place that's really important is when you call 911 because you're calling in a car accident, you've got to be very specific as to where the accident is. You know, are we northbound or southbound or eastbound or westbound before this exit, after this exit, this is the mile marker. That's a really common one. So otherwise people end up driving in circles looking for the accident and that's a really big deal. Okay, well, thanks for, Thanks for telling us that because I wouldn't have even known to ask the question. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind with that, the 911 system is very jurisdictionally dependent. Depending on where you are, you might call 911 and have the person who picks up the phone be able to send you help. If you call 911 and you're on a highway, they're probably going to send you to another dispatcher. And they might do that under any circumstance and call and say, you're going to talk to the police dispatcher first. They're going to send you to a medical dispatcher second. So stay on the line and expect that you might have to be transferred to get the right people to come to you. And then the dispatchers will almost always, depending on the circumstances, give you instructions as to what to do. So you got to stay on the line to get those instructions, depending on what the circumstances are. So maybe you could tell us as we start going through your list, when when you should be calling 911 or if you should just always be calling 911. Because I'm always amazed when I'm watching a movie or something where I hear someone telling a story and they don't call 911. They just get in their car and they're like, we're just going to go to the hospital. And you think, why are they doing that? Why don't they just call 911? So, so you know what? That's a great one. And we'll, let's just hit that next right now because that's a really good point. I think you should call 911, number one, if you don't have the ability to get yourself to the hospital. And number two, if you reasonably think the emergency room is the place for things that can kill you or hurt you and you don't have another place to go. If you can go to an urgent care for certain things, you can go to an urgent care, you can go to your doctor. But 911 is really for things that are time sensitive. Um, if you don't have another way to go, you have to use 911, you have to use an ambulance anyway. They might come to your house more slow down, not use the lights and sirens you just heard. Um, but if you're any doubt at all, if there's any question at all, and right now with the, um, with the, the COVID, um, and we talked about this last week, um, it is so important that you call 911 if you have any doubt at all. If there's any question that what you have is something serious, call. Um, Flu-like symptoms normally don't qualify. Cuts, bruises, bumps, things like that don't. Um, but if you're not sure, call us, honestly. We'll figure it out when we get there. So, um, but it's important with this to call early. Um, it's very funny, there was a video I saw, somebody's ring doorbell um, yesterday or the day before, Jackson and I were watching it. And um, the man was choking and he ran to the neighbor's house and the neighbor, did the Heimlich on him and saved his life. So um, but the first thing she did is start to put her arms around the guy to do a Heimlich maneuver and then looked at her husband, boyfriend, husband, whoever the male person was there and said, call 911. And I was so impressed that she started that call there. I mean, the average call processing time is a minute or two. And then on top of that, you have to get in the truck and drive and get to the scene. So there's a good, you know, six to eight minutes to get that done. That's six to eight minutes. You can shave any time off of that. If you wait a minute, that's a minute shorter that the ambulance gets there. And if you've ever waited for an ambulance when, when you're, you know, all alone, and I've done this when I was a bystander, um, a minute or two or four seems like a week. So, yeah. yeah, that's good yeah. advice. Um, yeah, and so the, I'll, I'll kind of segue here to the one of the things that I'm going a little out of order for what I wanted to talk about. Um, but it's really important that you learn what the signs and symptoms are of certain really critical emergencies. Um, strokes and heart attacks are the two biggest ones because they're the two most time sensitive ones. When you have a heart attack and your heart muscle is not getting oxygen, the longer you wait, the more heart muscle dies. So time is muscle. The same thing for a stroke where your heart's brain's not getting oxygen because something's occluding it. Time is brain. So you've got a really short window to do that stuff. You absolutely have to identify. So for a stroke, 
you're looking for people that have something that's on one side of their body versus the other side. So if the person has a facial droop or they can't speak or one of their arms is weak compared to the other one, those are really quick signs of a stroke and you can tell very quickly. So somebody who has slurred speech, facial droop, um, and an arm weakness or hand weakness compared to one or the other. You know, somebody puts their hands up, one side falls down versus the other side falls down and the other one stays up. Those are really good signs. What we call lateralizing, which means one side of the body versus the other. But anytime you got something where one side of the body versus the other is bad, call. Same thing for a stroke. If you have somebody whose mentation, their, their brain is acting funny, they're confused, they're um, saying inappropriate words. They don't understand where they are and what's going on, especially if these are a change from what they're normally like, call right away. Just don't even wait. Those are instantaneous calls. Um, the heart attacks are more are, are odder because what you normally think about for a heart attack is someone who's got chest pressure, you know, right in the middle of your chest and it feels like an elephant is sitting on your chest. And that's a good, a very hallmark uh, thing that can be um, a, a, a heart attack, an MI. But there's so many other things that can be cardiac uh, problems and it can present in a, numer a, a number of different ways. It can be neck pain, it can be jaw pain, it can be arm pain, it can be indigestion. It can be kind of a general malaise, a general feeling crappy where you don't feel great, but you don't know what it is and it kind of came on suddenly. It can have an episode of sweats with it when suddenly you break out on a burst of sweats. That's a good indicator. Um, and you have to be aware that certain classes of patient almost always present with those odd symptoms. Um, diabetic patients don't perceive um, pain the same way because there's neuropathy. So diabetic patients don't perceive pain the same way. So they may not feel any pain at all. It might just be a general malaise. And women, female patients, especially as they get older, perceive pain differently. So women and diabetics and diabetic women really don't have the same symptomology. So you have to look beyond chest pain for something that could be yeah. cardiac in nature for, for those classes of patients. So what's considered older, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, as I turned 50 this year, older is, is defined. So, um, so my, my definition is, is definitely fluid. Um, for women, older is usually after menopause. So, oh, okay. yeah, so there's no hard bright line on that, but you lose the protection that estrogen affords you as a woman once you've gone through menopause. So that's an early question that we'll ask. And that's something that you would kind of want to look for in yourself or, or whoever you're, you're asking with. Um, but there's no bright line that says over 50, over 40, yeah. over 60. Um, and for guys, any guy can have an MI at any time, but have any kind of symptomology with that. So don't even worry about men with the ages. I mean, unfortunately, men have uh, no protective uh, no hormonal protection the way women do. I have heard that women have typically different symptoms when they're having a heart attack. Very true. And it gets missed, unfortunately, because of that. So please listen to what I'm saying. If you're having weird symptoms, weird feelings, um, you're not sure what it is, um, you know, we'll always go out there and we will do a, an EKG on you and see what we see and see what we can tell there. Um, but even that's not always dispositive. You know, if you have weird symptoms and it's kind of between your jaw and your belly button and your shoulders and it's a change in your normal circumstance and you don't feel good. Those are, you know, you know, too, when you're like, wow, something's not right with me. That's a good indicator yeah. of when it's time to go. Well, I think what happens with a lot of people is they just think, oh, I'm sure it's nothing. Yeah. I don't want to be a hypochondriac. I'm not going to have an ambulance come here because I have yeah. heartburn. So, but it sounds like what you're saying is it's okay. Yeah. Be yeah. a hypochondriac. You, better to be no. a hypochondriac than be dead. Absolutely. We, we, I, you know, the, the paramedics and the EMTs will always take care of you and will would much rather, much, much, much rather come to your house and check and say there's nothing going on or have it give you a trip to the hospital, nice and easy, no muss, no fuss and have nothing going on. than have you blow off your symptoms, not have it be something serious. Think you're not think you're not having something serious. And at the end of the day, it is, um, you know, with COVID, there's a lot of people that aren't calling the ambulance right now. Um, you know, yeah. 911 volume and ED volume are down enormously because people are afraid of catching COVID. And we're seeing out of hospital fatalities higher than they were previously. And we can't attribute how much of that is undiagnosed COVID and how much of that is untreated cardiac and strokes and things like that, that people are just staying at home, not wanting to go into 911 and dying because of it. And I think that there's a, there's an element of that, that we're you're not going to know for a while if we ever know with any degree of certainty, but it's certainly happening because those people aren't not having double negative, I realize, but they're, they're not, not having heart attacks and not, not having strokes. So. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. So, so okay. So heart attacks, stroke, and I have to ask you: Isn't there some mnemonic device that you're supposed to use for stroke? I sort of remember oh, seeing yeah. it on a poster somewhere. Uh, face, arm, speech, time. F A S T. So you look for facial droop, arm weakness slurred speech and then you have to do it as quick as you can the t is for time so fast okay. so and it's just a quick easy assessment anybody can do it so one of the other things and it's really counterintuitive that people don't do i see lots of people they have first aid kits in their houses and they've got band-aids and they've got triangular cravats and pins and neosporin and all sorts of great things you can buy and i see all these kits you know you can buy a kit at, at cvs or walgreens and stuff like that and they have all sorts of cool things and trust me having band-aids in your house and gauze pads you know square gauze pads is great to have but that's not going to save your life yeah. one of the easiest things and everybody should have one um is to have a tourniquet um, because we found, and it's funny, when I trained, and I trained in the 80s, people were like, don't put tourniquets on. Tourniquet, you could lose somebody's arm if you leave the tourniquet on too long. Guess what? <laughs> you bleed out and die way before you lose your arm or your leg. So Yeah, I think I've heard that, that if you apply a yeah. tourniquet when the person didn't need one, they would just end up losing a limb. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't even happen anyway. The, 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 the time to lose a limb is hours. So it's really not something you really have to worry about. But you can bleed to death in minutes from an arterial bleed. And one of the things that really dramatically improves, improves the ability to survive um, some kind of wound. And it can just be an accidental cut. It could be something more nefarious. Um, we live in a world, unfortunately, of active shooters. Um, but you can just as easily cut your hand on a kitchen knife and bleed to death or come close is to have a tourniquet. And you're going to say, well, Matt, the hell am I going to get a tourniquet from? Right. So I'm going to use a thing here. and I'm going to demonstrate this in a few seconds. This is called a cat tourniquet. This is a combat action tourniquet. It's a military tourniquet. Um, it was originally uh, piloted by the military. There's a bunch of different ones, but I think this is probably the easiest for the average person to use. Um, I looked it up. You can buy a three pack of these on Amazon for $24. Okay. Um, and you can train with it and play with it because you want to be able to make sure you actually know how to use it. Um, it's not something you're just going to throw on the first time. You got to play with it a few times to get good at it. But these literally, you can buy a three pack of these on Amazon for 24 bucks. You can put one in your purse, you can keep one in your house and you can play with one for training. And at the end of the day, this is something that can save your life. So this is one that I have had out for years and I use it to play around with. And just to show you how easy this is to do, I'm going to give this to Jackson. And Jackson's going to demonstrate two important things. The first he's going to demonstrate is how to put the tourniquet on me because he, he, he should be able to treat me if I'm the person with him. But it's just yeah. as important that you be able to put a tourniquet on yourself. So first, Jackson's going to do show you how quickly he can put a tourniquet on my arm. So you ready? Oops, let me. Oh, wait. Let me see if I can make you guys bigger. Oh, we're bigger now. Cool. All right. Ready? So you put it as high as you can and you cinch it up and you tighten down the windlass as tight as you can. You can do it tighter than that, tighter. That's really tight. And then you lock it in place. And what did that take, 15 seconds? Yeah. And that is a good tourniquet. I don't have a pulse past it. So if you're bleeding and there's arterial blood coming out and you can't stop it, that's really good actually. You got it really tight tonight. <laughs> um, this will stop the bleeding. Yeah. But how does the average person know if that's arterial blood? So as arterial blood will be spurting out, it'll be uncontrolled bleeding. Okay. And it could, if it's not bleed, uh, arterial blood, it could be coming out and gushing out if it's not spraying out, but it'll be significant. And honestly, if you're not sure, put a tourniquet on. You got a couple hours to figure it out. Okay, let's take that off. So it's not like something you're gonna make anything worse by doing a tourniquet. No, you can't. So so Jackson, if, if you put a tourniquet on and it's still bleeding, what do you do? Stick a tourniquet. Where? Right below it right below it you hear that another one then. you put a second one on so if that one you put the bleeding on and there's still some bleeding jackson says you put a second tourniquet on just below it and then tie the second one down you don't take the first one off or try to retighten it just put a second one on then and on there which is really nice so but jackson's going to show you next how to put it on yourself oh well, this is definitely something people should practice yep Now, if I cut my finger, I don't need to do this. No, you'd only do this for serious <laughs> bleeding. But but this is the thing, is like if you're seriously bleeding like this, yeah, you only have minutes to get this done. And Jackson's done. It's another 15 seconds. Is it okay? Yeah, it just hurts. Yeah, I know it hurts. Leave it on. It's supposed to hurt. <laughs> so stand up and show them. You can kind of see um 
Jackson's arms are two different colors right now because there's no blood supply coming to this one. So it's not a big deal for the little bit of time we've got right now, but you can see how quickly, I'll pop it off you, sweetie, how quickly Jackson's able to put that tourniquet on his arm. The hardest thing to do is to be able to self-apply a tourniquet on your dominant arm. If your right arm, do it. Mm -hmm. teach yourself how to do it on your right arm because you fumble around with your left. But you got to practice that once or twice, but it's super important to be able to do this. Let me do it on my right arm. No, you don't have to do it for us, sweetie. That was okay. But you did a great job and you were able to apply it to yeah, him in 15 seconds. And he was able to apply it to himself in 15 seconds. And he knows where we keep this in the house. And and for you know 20 bucks on Amazon, you've got one or two of those to keep around and that can absolutely save your life. What if you don't have that? Let's go back to the movies, Matt. You know, they always rip up a shirt or something like that. Yeah. Jackson can answer that question. Jackson, if you didn't have a tourniquet, what would you do? Take a scarf and a pen, and you would usually use that to kind of tie it around your arm and make a makeshift tourniquet. Okay. So the idea is that you're tightening it, but something has to kind of hold it in place. Right. So there's two things if you're making a, a makeshift tourniquet. Number one is you don't want something thin. You want something that's wider. I'm going to try to get it in place here. You know, a couple of inches wide like this. This is a good two inches wide, three inches wide. So you want something that's wide and flat, not something thin. And then what you'd find is, this is what we call the windlass. You can use anything, a pen or something like that, just to spin it. And that's what makes it get yeah. tight. Okay. But we practiced as we taught him how to do this. And he practiced how to do this with a, a t-shirt. And he ripped the t-shirt, made it into a strip, spun it in place with a pen and tied it off. And he was able to make a makeshift tourniquet. It doesn't go on quite as fast as this, but if you're stuck and you don't have anything yeah. else to do, you can absolutely do it. It's better than nothing. It is better than nothing. And this is absolutely a, a, a tool that can save your life. And it's super inexpensive. It's super easy to do. Um, and just to show you, and people probably think I'm a little crazy for this, um, but this is a tourniquet in a, in a bag that Jackson carries in his backpack and he brings to school with him. And he just keeps it stuffed in there. And it doesn't take up a lot of space. You can see how easy this is. It's in a Ziploc bag um, so that it doesn't take up a lot of space. It doesn't get beat up. But this just sits in the bottom of his backpack. And God forbid at school, he ever needs a tourniquet. There's one here. That's what happens when your dad is a paramedic. It is what happens when your dad is a paramedic. But Jackson's a big boy, and he got this really well done. He's had this for years. Um, he doesn't play with it. It's not a toy. But he's absolutely able to, to do this. At one point, the uh, the principal of the school was like, you have a tourniquet in your backpack? And Jackson's like, yeah. And the teacher, the, the principal was like, all right, I got nothing to say to that. It makes sense to have it, you know? So, <laughs> Everyone should. I think so, too. Um, you know, I travel a lot for work. Um, and in my backpack, I carry a tourniquet. Um, and then I have one in my car. I have a little kit. It's called an IFAC, an individual first aid kit, a little kit about this big that I keep in my car with a few other things. I don't need a huge giant first aid kit. The most of that stuff in your giant first aid kit is not going to save your life. But yeah. keeping a little first aid kit this big with a tourniquet and a couple other things and having it right accessible to you in the glove compartment of your car where you can just reach and grab it when you need it is really important. That's good to know because we got one for the office and I'm sure that there is not a tourniquet in it. Yeah. Most commercial first aid kits don't have tourniquets, which is why it's so, uh, it's such, it's a shame for me because I see that all the time in these kits and they don't, they don't have them. Um, and they're so easy to get, but you can just honestly go buy them on Amazon. Like I said, the quick search that I found found a three pack for 24 bucks and, uh, for, you know, for $8 a piece, you buy them and just stick them on the outside, rubber band it, tape it in place, something like that. So Jackson, have you ever had to apply a tourniquet in real life to anyone? Nope. <laughs> okay. I hope that never happens. But if you ever did, you'd know what to do. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I good think Jackson, probably, right I think you probably know what to do most, better than most adults, to be honest with you. But he I agree. Really good at I agree. So. I agree. If somebody was in a situation like that and me and Jackson were the only ones there, I'm sure Jackson would be the one that would save the day. Yeah, and keeping your head on is an important thing. Um, you know, there were a couple other things I was going to talk about, um, and and this actually segues well to one of the other things I wanted to talk about, which is kind of keeping your head in an emergency. Um, knowing what to do is one thing, but keeping your head is an important thing, um, and and we call that scene safety for our world, which is really the most important thing. You know, whenever you're being tested as a paramedic, you're like scene safety before you do anything else, and scene safety is kind of one of these you know weird terms we talk about because I don't really know what's safe. No scene is ever completely safe. But you got to keep your head around you. You got to like watch what's going on. Um, if you're in a place where somebody's shooting, getting to a place of safety and really being to a place of safety is a big deal. Um, and you got to do that quick. You know, finding the difference where you're, you know, something's between you and the person shooting that'll stop a bullet is a big deal. That's the difference. You know, that's cover. That's not just concealment. That's not just a bush. Um, another really common thing that we've seen, and unfortunately, I've seen it a number of times in my career, are people that stop to help at car accident scenes. And it's great to help. Don't not help. 
just be aware. You got to make sure your car is parked in the right place. And you got to make sure you're not getting hit by a car. Lots of people, professional rescuers get killed on car accident scenes because they are out in the roadway. And if you're not a professional rescuer, you got to be super careful that you don't get killed by another car coming through the scene. You know, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but all the paramedics and EMTs and cops and firefighters these days wear a bright yellow safety vest so that we're visible because you know, you want to make sure that the, the car can see you, but even that's not, you know, the, the end all be all. Um, you know, I keep a traffic safety vest in my car if God forbid I have to stop. Um, but even then I'm hyper, hyper aware of where I am and what's going on. Um, and if you're not good at it, you need to be really aware of this, of the safety uh, aspects of what you're doing. That you're not putting yourself in harm's way. That doesn't mean don't help. That just means look around, see yeah. what's going on, be aware, don't tunnel vision in and go like, oh, okay, there's a car accident right here. I'm gonna go help the people in the car accident and not realize that cars are whizzing by you. Um, and you know, at least one time in my career, knock on wood, I remember going on a call in Lawrence Township when I was a medic down there and the scene was safe and the cops had the scene controlled and everything was great. Um, and a car blew through the scene and went around the cops and buzzed by and brushed against me so close that the heat of the friction of the car brushing me melted my uniform pants in a little strip. Wow. I mean. Yeah, I was like literally a fraction of an inch from being, you know, seriously injured at this car accident. And it gives you a pause because, you know, even a professional rescuer who does it every day of their life can get hit by a car and, and hurt or killed. So those are the kind of things you just want to have your, your head on on those things. It's really important. Yeah. I've definitely so, heard those kinds of stories. Um, but most accidents probably are going to happen at home, aren't they? They do. Um, you know, the vast majority of the things you need to learn. And if you really want to do this, take a first aid course. You can do online first aid courses. Um, call your local uh, EMS agency or your local fire department. They'll find you a first aid course. Um, with the internet, it's really easy to do these things. If you really have an interest in this, um, you know, join your local EMS agency, join your local volunteer first aid squad, or go get some formal EMS training, even if it's basic training. Um, it can really help you with this stuff. Um, one of the things that every person should absolutely have a CPR training. There is no excuse at all in this planet for not having uh, CPR training. Um, I actually think that CPR training and the bleeding control, which is what we taught for the tourniquet here today and a few other things that go with that, really should be just absolutely every human should have them. But there's no excuse not to have basic uh, CPR training. And, and I, I think people are afraid, number one, I'm going to hurt somebody, which is something I see very commonly as, oh, I don't want to do CPR, I might hurt them. If you're doing CPR on somebody, it's because their heart has already stopped. Yeah. So they're dead. You can't make them deader. So really yeah. <laughs> big deal. You can't do harm to somebody whose heart has already stopped. So there's no downside to that. One of the things that I think there is some veracity to, there's some legitimacy, is people that are afraid of um catching a disease. They don't want to put their mouth on somebody else. I'll be honest with you. I'm not too keen on putting my mouth on the average person either. So I get where that's coming from. And a lot of paramedics and EMTs have carried a, a barrier mask, like a little thing that goes like a, a one-way valve or a pocket mask for a long time. Um, but you don't even need that. You can do hands-only CPR and make a difference between saving somebody's life. You can circulate the blood. You know, by, by doing compressions, you're moving the blood around the body. And there's enough oxygen in your body without you breathing for somebody for a good long time, good couple of minutes until the professional rescuers get there and can actually do the breathing for you to save your life. And it will absolutely make the difference. When you don't have out-of-hospital CPR and out-of-hospital uh, defibrillation, the AED that you see on the wall in a lot of places and use that, literally, um, you lose 10% survivability a minute. And after six minutes yeah. or eight minutes, people's brains are dead. So you really have to move fast there. And without putting your mouth on somebody, you can literally just put your hands on somebody's chest, push hard and fast, really hard and as fast as you can, and it will do good. Even if you've never had a CPR class and somebody's heart stops, hard and fast on the chest is gonna save their life. It's gonna really give them a fighting chance they wouldn't otherwise have. So it's a really, really big thing. It's super easy to learn. It's a couple hours of class. One of the other things we talked about is the Heimlich maneuver and learning how to clear somebody who's choking is part of the CPR class. Um, but choking calls happen once a millennium, very, very rarely. Like call we talked about in the, the ring doorbell thing is extremely rare. They happen, you gotta be prepared for it, but that's low probability. CPR calls, CPR cases happen every day. And it might be honestly at the end of the day, it might be your family member you save. It might be your husband or your wife or your mom or your dad at the end of the day, that can really, really matter. So you don't have yeah. anything in your house, but you darn well have hands. That's what I'm thinking is even if you're thinking, I, I don't want to do CPR on a stranger, but chances are whoever needs the CPR, you're probably going to know them. They yeah. could be your husband, your spouse, your child, yeah. whoever, who, a family member that you're around. And I think 
the worst feeling is to be in an emergency situation like that and to feel completely helpless. Um, like, I, I don't know what to do. I just have to stand here and wait for somebody to come. Yeah. And, and even when you're standing there and you don't know what to do and you're waiting, it's not a fun feeling. Um, but at least yeah. one time in my life, many, many years ago, I remember uh, an event that happened at a summer camp I was at and somebody broke their leg and I stood there and I had no idea what to do. And I hated that feeling. And I was actually working in an ER at the time and as a, as a volunteer. So I was exposed to medicine and still didn't know what to do. And you're right. It's a horrible feeling. So um, and it's pretty yeah. easy for people to um, take a CPR class, learn the signs and symptoms of heart attacks and strokes, keep a tourniquet handy. There's a couple of quick things right there that will make a big difference. Thank you. Well, I'm going to do it. I did take CPR training many years ago, but I, I haven't gone back and I probably could be somewhat useful if, if somebody needed CPR, but I definitely would like to brush up on that and renew my skills. Well, when our COVID world is over, we can definitely get you back into a first aid class. And we can probably get somebody to come out and do one for your firm, to be honest with you, yeah. site, which is easy to accomplish. And how important do you think it is for people who have kids? I know if there's an infant, you know, nobody wants to think about being in a situation like that, but there's sort of a different standard for when you have to do CPR on an infant or a child, right? Yeah, you'll learn that in the basic CPR class as well. There is a, a there are differentiations uh, in technique as to what to do for a child and an infant, and especially for clearing a child or an infant's airway, um, because their airway, their their breathing passages are smaller. So how you handle that? Um, but absolutely, again, I I've always been comfortable as a parent because I've been doing EMS my entire adult life. Um, but if you're not you're having kids, you're babysitting, you're around kids and toddlers, you have a pool. There's a whole bunch of things that increase your likelihood of having a, a bad event happen. Um, so those are all really, really good reasons to go out and take a CPR course. Um, and, you know, look, Jackson is 10. He's almost 11. He'll be 11 in a few weeks. Um, he's a pretty big 10 year old, to be honest with you. He's, you can't see it sitting here. But Jackson could competently do CPR. He could clear an airway. He can do a, a tourniquet. And if Jackson can do that stuff, you can do it. So, so I want to ask you a million questions, but the point of this wasn't for you to actually teach us, you know, how to do all of these emergencies, but to kind of let people know like what the short list is, yeah. what you absolutely learn to do. Obviously you're not doing heart surgery at home, but if somebody's choking or if somebody needs CPR and, and actually identifying when somebody needs those things. And I really like the way you started out with just calling 911 right away. Yeah, it is really important to identify these things early and have a plan. Honestly, one of the things that, that, that and I want to say kills people, but literally and figuratively, is to just be paralyzed and not take action. You're better off taking action. You're better off calling 911 and not having them be needed. You're better off taking an action, trying to do CPR or trying to clear someone's airway or using a tourniquet than when it's not necessary than the opposite being true when you would not do something when it would be necessary and, and there could be a, 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 a you know a preventable bad outcome and if somebody wants to do all of this learn cpr learn first aid and all of these emergency measures that the average person should know how do they do that how do they go about finding a class to take this cool thing called the internet and <laughs> all kidding aside if you were to tell me I wanted to do, I live in Hillsborough. If I said CPR training in Hillsborough, you'll have a dozen places come up. You can call the local EMS agency in the community where you live. You can call the local fire department in the community where you live. You can call the local hospital. Any of those places, almost all of them have community resources to do uh, CPR training. The same way that uh, the local police departments all do um, car seat safety checks. Um, they go out into the community and teach those classes. Um, but uh, honestly, a Google search will come up with some pretty good answers. But if you're you're stuck on Google and not sure where to go, your police department, your fire department, your EMS, and your hospital will always have resources for that. Oh, good. Excellent. So as soon as we're allowed to leave our homes, I'm going to be in touch with you so that I can learn CPR again. Yeah. And like I said, you know, it'd be, it'd be a neat opportunity. I think you could probably do a nice PSA and show people what it's like to do a class, stream part of it like this and show people how easy it is to do CPR. We can kind of combine. I'm, I'm not an instructor anymore. I was for many, many years, but I'm sure I can find you an instructor from one of the local uh, EMS fire departments or hospitals that would love to come out and live stream some training with you. That would be awesome. I would love that. Okay. So recap, don't be afraid to call 911 people. Even if you think you're being hypochondriac, don't be afraid to call 911. 
learn CPR, take CPR instruction and first aid instruction and keep a tourniquet around because you really never know if you're going to need it. Yeah. And learn the signs and symptoms of heart attacks and strokes. Know yeah. what you're looking for and have that in the back of your mind. Even if, if it seems like it might be a funny thing, that's a, an odd symptom that might not be a heart attack or a stroke. If you're not sure, err on the side of it being that and call for help. And time matters on those really, really importantly. I do have another question because this is something <laughs> all the time i could well i could do this all day but this will be my um so many people will fall and hit their head or somehow they end up hitting their head and they think well i have a headache but i'm not gonna go to the hospital it's probably nothing and this is the thing i love if it gets worse i'll go to the hospital and I always think, but what does that mean? If you die in the middle of the night, you'll go to the hospital. I'm always afraid that someone has a concussion. Yeah, but concussions aren't fatal. They're not. They concussions all the time. Look at TV, look at sports figures. People in sports get concussions every day in contact sports. They don't die from them. What you're worried about when you're dying, things that kill you from a head injury is either something in your neck. If you break your neck very high and you'll know that instantaneously, you'll know because you won't be able to move your arms and your legs or you won't be able to breathe. That's a very critical thing. But most of the people who have, you know, you're, this is, this is odd, but your brain is pretty darn well protected. Okay. It's got like a fluid barrier around it and your skull around it. And both are hard. Okay. You'll know if you've got something going on, you know, the average fall hit your head isn't usually the kind of thing that causes fatality. If you have somebody who passes out and wakes back up, that's a bad thing. So somebody who loses consciousness okay. and either stays unconscious or loses consciousness and wakes back up. Somebody who's confused, somebody who has any of those other signs, like they have visual disturbances or speech disturbances or one of their arms versus their legs isn't working, those are all bad signs. But honestly, you gotta go out of your way to, to hurt your brain. It's, it's much harder to do that. Um, and you, you'll know pretty quick. The hallmark of that is somebody who loses consciousness or alteration in mental status. They're repetitive. Okay. Questions. They, they can't, um, they don't know where they are or what they are. They're confused. They answer the same question over and over. They are unconscious, obviously, or they lost consciousness and then they wake up. Those are all bad things. Um, but the average person they have been bopped in the head does not always have to go to the hospital. Okay. So it's really the symptoms yeah. that you described. Okay, yeah. good. You. Yeah, all of these things become signs of, uh, generated by symptoms. Um, the amount of kinetic energy that, you know, gets into a person, you know, if you have to look at what happened to them too, if they fall from standing, that's one thing. If they fall from a height, that's another. Um, you know, if you get punched, it's one thing. If you get hit in the head with a two by four, it's different. Really have to look at the amount of energy that goes into somebody's head because it, it's hard to, to, to beat a head. Our heads are pretty hard. They're, they're pretty well protected for a reason, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'd love to have you on again. Anytime. And Jackson. Too. <laughs> and Jackson proved that anybody can do a tourniquet. So if Jackson can do a tourniquet at age 10 and do it competently and retain that skill, anybody can do it. So don't tell me, oh my God, this is so hard to do because it's really not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the fear. And if you're uncomfortable with it, the, the best way to get comfortable with it is to just do it. Just learn yeah. how to do it. Yeah. And find somebody who can teach you. Take a bleeding control class too, especially too, if you're in a high risk area, if you're a teacher, you were in places of mass gatherings, your things like that, any place where your world is the kind of place where a mass shooting might happen, your yeah. index of, of needing that training and keeping a tourniquet around goes up and it can happen to any time to any person anywhere but there are certain places that are much more likely unfortunately and if you're in those places like a school it has to be something you're considering and this is 2020 um you know we've got to be honest about it we've got to be honest about the risk awesome well thank you for sharing thank you jackson and we'll, we'll i'm sure we're going to have you on here again well, jackson is happy to come on anytime you want him awesome Maybe he should teach the CPR. I don't know how to do CPR yet. I could probably learn pretty quick, but. Hard and fast. It's got to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, we're going to leave you. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Christina.